Well, hello everybody. Welcome to day 25, part three. I'm going to do my part two of my sleep seminar. If you missed the first one it's a couple days ago, I'm going to revisit a few of those topics. Today we're going to talk mostly about insomnia. This is a topic that I think I'm an expert in, considering I went through a couple of years of abysmal sleep. And um, I did a lot of things in order to correct that. I will say that uh, you're going to notice that certain things work really well for you. Certain things take a long time, but if you stick with it, you will be able to increase the sleep quality and the amount of time that you can sleep dramatically. But it is a function of consistency with the things I'm going to show you guys. A lot of the reasons why I couldn't sleep, I will get into today because they may be some of the reasons why you couldn't sleep, but we'll talk about how to mitigate those things. First thing to recognize is some people are just predisposed brain-wise or physically to not be able to sleep well. If you have physical pain and that's preventing you from sleeping, it's really important that you manage your physical pain. Guys, I will say that when it comes to sleep, I've said this many times in other seminars, sleep is critical for brain function, for body function, for immune function. You are three times more likely to get a common cold if you're underslept. That is well-founded research. I'll put a link to an, a, a video up here where they, they talk about that. And if you read, again, Dr. Matthew Walker's book from Stanford University, he runs the sleep study clinic there. It's, it's probably the leading expert on sleep right now in the world, one, certainly one of the top guys. Um, but it maps onto everything from IQ, to memory recall, like I said, to obviously your energy, your predictability that you're gonna get into a, a car accident. Um, like I said, immune function, it goes on and on and on and on. And obviously what we're most concerned about today is our immune system. So we gotta make sure we're sleeping. Some people, like I said, are just predisposed. Now this has a lot to do with brain chemistry. And if you, like I said, if you're in physical pain, you must find a way to mitigate that pain. And that means that you're absolutely diligent on if your knee hurts, you find out why does your knee hurt and you find out how to fix your knee. It's not, oh, I'll fix it tomorrow. We talked about in previous videos, some easy things that might be able to help you. So if you feel physical pain in knees or in your hips, putting something like a pillow between your knees, laying on your side in the fetal position, making sure that your neck is neutral, your neck's not all jacked up like this with three pillows. Similarly, it's not too flat, you want your neck neutral. Basic things like this we talked about to have physical comfort, hugging another pillow to keep your arms from going like this over your head so you're all jacked up and you're you know kind of laying like that, that's no good. That external rotation in the shoulder, no good. You wanna be hugging a pillow, fetal position is usually comfortable for most people. If you have things going on laying on your side, you can experiment with laying on your back, getting your neck neutral, putting something under your knees in that regard. I'm not going to rehash that seminar, but you get the idea. Physical pain is no good. You must get it addressed and there are ways to fix it. But what I mean here predisposed, again, it's mostly brain stuff. So we're, we're gonna talk about all that stuff in a future seminar, but I just want you to recognize that predisposition has a lot to do with are you a high dopamine brain? Are you, what's going on with serotonin? What's going on? There's all these chem, GABA. There's all these things that map onto predicting how well you sleep. So let's just grant the fact that every on every single one of these graphs, we're going to start with wherever you are. Are there ways to improve this stuff? These predispositions? Actually, yes. And I'll talk about that stuff later. But meaning... Is there a way that we can change a high dopamine brain? Is there a way? Yes, but I will talk about that in a future seminar, but I will allude to it later. So first we start off with predispositions. Next, we start with stress factors. So the predispositions I'm representing as these bars with the diagonals going across the bars. Here is the threshold for insomnia. So we're all starting here. Some people may be a little higher. Some people may be a little bit lower, meaning predisposition or genetics, whatever it may be. It, it's not just genes, guys. We can develop certain brains over time depending on our environments. So now stress 
stress becomes an issue. So now you have these predispositions, you're well be below the threshold. All of a sudden you get this stress factor and what happens? This stress factor makes you, so I'm gonna represent the stress factor with vertical bars. Now you're over the insomnia threshold. Now you have insomnia. So this was me for a long time. This was a, an emotional cascade in my brain for way too long. And I became extremely familiar with, with what it's like to feel emotional stress or pain when you're trying to sleep. Um, I'll get to all the things that we can do about that in a minute. I just want you to recognize what the pattern is here. Then what starts to happen is, whether you know it or not, all this time, and this is what started to happen to me, all this time that you go with all this stress, you start to do things that perpetuate the problem. They're, they're literally called perpetuating factors. So I'm gonna put perpetuating factors with these vertical bars. So now as the stress goes down, you're actually below the threshold. The problem is, is that you built in all of these perpetuating factors that keep you over that threshold. And we will talk about what those perpetuating factors are coming up because it's going to be how you fix the problem. All right, so now eventually the goal would be um, um, to get the stress continued to lower and get those perpetuating factors to come down or to be non-existent so that you don't hit that insomnia threshold. <clears throat> so guys, let's get a few things off the board right now. We've talked a lot in previous seminars about breathing and sleep apnea and sleeping with your mouth open. I would be willing to bet that that's going to, first of all, if you sleep with your mouth open in general, tape it shut and watch how much your sleep quality improves because we're not just talking about, you know, this sleep, we could talk, call it sleep quality, sleep efficiency, meaning that when you sleep, you're actually sleeping. We talked previously about how important it is to get all of the phases of sleep, um, meaning, meaning all five phases, you're getting into REM sleep and you get through sleep cycles um, at least five times a night. However, <clears throat> many people aren't getting that REM sleep. They're not getting those full deep cycle sleeps. And a lot of the reason is how they breathe. If you know for a fact you have sleep apnea, you have to fix it. You have to either talk to a doctor, get a surgery or wear the mask, whatever it is, learn that is it an obstruction in there? Is it simply how you're breathing? I have been doing breath work for the, I will be doing it all 40 days and I, I evolve it and I show you where it can go. If you don't recognize by now the importance of breathing after me talking all of this time and what, what's going on in society and how it maps onto your digestive system, your immune system, your, it's everything guys. If you, are still reluctant to fix your breathing. I literally can't pound my feet anymore than to say, you need to breathe through your nose. You must keep your mouth shut, breathe through your nose all day. If you notice that you're a mouth breather, you have to make every effort to solve this issue. And there are ways to solve it. I showed you guys the neti pot that I started to use. I don't have allergies. I noticed that this time of year, um, there's a lot of pollen in the air. I was sleeping with my window open, didn't realize it. When I got up in the morning and I was, I never obviously talk when I do guided meditations. Um, I, I only started doing guided meditations out loud with you guys. So my, I never talked first thing in the morning. I would do my regular routine. But I noticed that as I was doing these guided meditations and attempting to talk you through these guided meditations, that I had an extra phlegm in my throat well, within an hour or two, it goes away. So I said, geez, how long has that been there? Well, I started to realize I've been sleeping with my window open. There's a lot of pollen. I'm breathing that in. I'm laying on my back. It takes an hour or two for that to clear out. So for the benefit of everybody listening to the meditation, you know, all 12 of you, um, I am using the neti pot and it's been unbelievable, not just for my voice, but actually to clear out my sinuses 10, 15% more. So the quality of the breath work is even better. Giving you pearls here, guys. That means that if you need to use the neti pot before you go to bed, use it because, and then tape your mouth shut. Notice the difference. It's that important. You're getting pearls here, guys. I'm telling you. 
So now, take sleep apnea off the board. Take taping mouth off the board. Take neti pot off the board. All these things are important. Now we'll just talk about general sleep hygiene, meaning that when you wake up in the morning, guys, it's really bad to keep hitting the snooze button. Snooze, snooze, snooze. It's no good. Once the alarm goes off, get up. It's really important that you get up the same day all the time, keeping a sleep schedule. This is well-founded research. You need to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. Of those two, which is most important? Getting up at the same time is most important. And we'll talk about why in a few minutes. If you go to bed at night and you notice you can't sleep, don't force it. So if you go down, if you lay down and you realize that 20 minutes later, you're still like this, eyes open, you're not sleeping, guys, get up. But here's the thing. Again, if you didn't hear part one, you need to hear part one. If your room's not dark, if your room's not cool, if you, if you have the dog walking all over your, you or the cat on your head, if your wife is kicking you and she's, you know, reading next to you or talking on the phone or texting, if you're, keep checking your phone, if you have all the, the, none of this stuff can be done. It needs to be completely dark. It needs to be cool. It's ideal if you're naked and wearing socks for reasons I talked about in the previous video. Go back and listen to that video to understand the ideal conditions in the bedroom to sleep. Um, it's important to exercise guys. It no more, you don't want to exercise just before you go to bed, either exercise first thing in the morning or four to five hours before you go to bed. This has been shown to help substantially with, with sleep. Obviously don't drink caffeine late in the afternoon. Some people are genetically slow metabolizers of caffeine. Some are fast. If you're a slow metabolizer, you're going to stay up uh, more easily. Don't drink alcohol. We talked about that in the previous video. You may think, yeah, but alcohol helps get me to go to bed. We talked about the problems there, guys. Alcohol is essentially knocking you out, which is preventing you from getting those first couple of phases. So your brain, those first, during the first part of the night, that's a big part of where it's learning and memory reinforcement comes in. So when you don't do that the first couple parts of the night, when you're essentially like sedating your brain instead of allowing it to, you have a drunk brain. So instead of allowing it to go through its natural rhythms there, you are you just put all the alcohol in there so it's now, it can't learn efficiently. And when your brain's learning, one of the things that we do see it doing is it actually speeds up 20 to 30 times in repetitions of what you did the day before. So for example, if you were, you know, learning, I'm just making it up, if you were learning a poem, your brain is reciting that poem like 20 to 30 times faster than how your brain would read it um, or try to learn it if you, were, um, if you were doing it in real time. Similarly with your math problems, whatever it is for your, for your children, you get the idea, whatever it is at work, some new task. The point is, whatever you're trying to learn the day before, if you miss out on that stuff because you were drinking, you're doing yourself a disservice. And, and this is another reason why IQ drops and memory retention gets worse and worse and worse as we get older. Uh, it's, it's even worse when we're talking about alcohol. So the quality of the sleep completely drops. And then there's a rebound effect later on in the night that actually wakes you up because the alcohol has worn off. It's bad, it's a bad, bad situation. Obviously smoking, smoking's a stimulant. It's also been shown to keep people awake. Obviously the key here is don't smoke. You don't wanna go to bed, so most people, you don't want to go to bed hungry. That doesn't mean go to bed full, like your stomach's about to pop. It means eat a normal dinner and then wait about 90 minutes and go to bed. Um, for some people, this is especially problematic. There's also genetics that predict whether or not this this is good or or not not necessarily bad, but who would benefit most from having uh, a later night meal. Um, I said dark and cool is important. The other thing is people that notice that they're thinking about things the next day while they, when they get into bed, it's important to just take out a notebook, assign a notebook and write down your to-do list for the next day. That way your brain knows I have all these things that I'm going to do tomorrow. You have a plan of action. You'll be surprised at how much more calm your brain is knowing that that plan of action is in place before you lay down. Next, so that's your sleep hygiene. These are the things that we're talking about that are, that are relevant. Next, 
we want to talk about sleep um, stimulus control. So again, you really want to only go to bed when you're tired. If you notice that you go to bed and you're not tired and you can't fall asleep, you have to recognize that your brain, it's like Pavlov's dog. Your, your brain recognizes the bed and the bedroom. This is why you don't want to do anything in the bedroom other than, other than sleep and have sex. Because if you're watching TV and doing all these other things in the bedroom, your brain associates the bedroom with all of that stuff. It's important that your bedroom is your bedroom. My bedroom does not have a television in it. And, and there's reasons why I told you I went through really bad stuff over here and I became desperate to find everything possible to help me sleep better. And like I said, what I did notice are these perpetuating things that I started to do um, back in 2011, 2012, 2013 that I'm sharing with you guys now that uh, that made things worse. So the, the, these are lessons learned, but this is also well-founded research uh, to help navigate you guys to get better here. Um, so again, if you're not falling asleep within 20 minutes, just get up. You can do something productive and then try again in a half an hour or 40 minutes, whatever. There's, if you notice after I go through all of this stuff, I have a few more things to go through. If you go through all these things and you notice that no matter what you're doing, you've, you've checked all these boxes, you can actually have a situation, it's called sleep restriction therapy. And that's why I said in the beginning of the two things, which is more important, going to bed at the same time or waking up at the same time. Waking up at the same time is the most important because if you're going to do sleep restriction therapy, first of all, you should do it with, with a doctor, uh, but you, you need to monitor it carefully. It means that if, let's suppose you wake up at 6 a.m. every day, it means that if you notice you go to bed at 11 and you wake up at six and you just can't sleep. You're not sleeping well. It means you go to bed at 12. It means that, okay, you're still not sleeping. It means that you go to bed at 1 a.m. You're still not sleeping, you go to bed at 2 a.m. Okay, from 2 a.m. to six, I can actually sleep. It's about sleep efficiency. It means that you're actually sleeping. You, you get a full sleep. Then what happens is you back it down now. Okay, well, what about, what if we did 1.30? What if we did one? No, nope. It's only at 1.30 I'm, I'm sleeping those full four and a half hours. So you stay with that for about a week or whatever the doctor recommends. And then you slowly, incrementally add a half an hour, little by little by little. So you're retraining your brain kind of backwards, but you have to find that sweet spot where you're actually maximizing your sleep efficiency. Because guys, it doesn't count if you lay in bed at 9 p.m. And, and set your alarm for 5 a.m. and say, I got eight hours of sleep, if half the night you're up. That's not eight hours of sleep. Eight hours of sleep means that you sleep for eight hours. So the minimum is seven and a half, meaning to have ideal health. Every half hour below that maps onto exponential problems in health, in uh, mental well-being and, and everything that we talked about, brain function, et cetera, et cetera. So it's super critical that you allow for eight for most people, anticipating about seven and a half hours of sleep. For people that have trouble with insomnia, most people in general don't nap during the day because it takes away the um, urgency to sleep later. So if you notice that you have trouble sleeping at night, don't sleep during the middle of the day. Um, some people can get away with napping, especially, you know, elite athletes that are really training hard and, and they, this is built into their program. That's a separate story. If you fall into that category, you can send me a, a reply down below and I'll talk about it. Next, you can do some relaxation therapy. So you get into bed and you now prepare a situation. So what I do, obviously in the morning, you guys see what I do with my breathing work and my red light therapy and everything. One of the things that I do in the house is I turn down all of the lights. So this right here is a Philips light. So you'll notice that it, see how it changes color? You see that? It has all different color for different phases of the day. So this would be obviously high noon, okay? And then it gets, it gets, um, uh, it change, it, I, it, this is on like a random setting right now, but it actually changes color. So that would be, you know, very late at night. Uh, and then this would be 
that's the dark, that's that orange light is the color for, you know, the middle of the night. So you'll notice that when the sun sets, there's different colors in the sky. These lights map onto the descending light of the sun. Yes, it's a little nerdy, but like I said, I was forward with you guys saying I was willing to do anything to fix it. And I will say that learning about light and how much light affects your eyes, because everybody talks about melatonin. Guys, light wakes you up. Light, light makes serotonin, excuse me, melatonin into serotonin. Okay, so when you close your eyes, your body can now start to create melatonin. If you're staring at the blue light of your cell phone, you're not creating melatonin. That's why you can't fall asleep if you're staring at your television. These are really power, this electronic devices let out extremely powerful blue light. So one of the things you can um, experiment with if you buy the red light is turn the red light on in your bedroom while you're getting ready to bed for bed. Red light had, antagonizes blue light. It's a very relaxing um, uh, atmosphere for your body. It, it, like I said, it antagonizes the blue light. You can close your eyes, sit in front of it, do some breathing work, uh, the, the very calm breath work that toward the end of our meditations in the morning, that's a classic example. So when we're done with the breath work, the things that we're doing at the end there, do that for five minutes. All of these things can get the mind ready for bed. Of course, these are the hardest things for people to do. These types of habits are the least likely things for people to do, yet they're the most effective. Then you can get into bed and do some, turn the red light off, obviously, and start to lay there and go through progressive relaxation techniques, which I do in the meditations in the morning. So you become aware of the body then you realize how much tension there is in various areas of the body. So you can start with your feet, let the tension go in your feet, let the tension go in the back of your legs, let the tension go in your abdomen, and you slowly move through the body, increasing this relaxation through this mental checklist. And you'll notice that it's extremely effective. Um, so if you put all these things together, guys, again, Go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time, tape your mouth if you need to, do the neti pot if you need to, use the red light, use the breathing techniques, make sure you don't go to bed too hungry, but not too full either. Make sure that you know, you're not drinking caffeine, don't drink alcohol, make sure you're not obviously smoking before bed. Um, you go to bed only when you're sleepy. If you're still having trouble, you know, make sure that you get up and move around and then go back. And remember the Pavlov's dog that associate your bedroom only with sleep. I mean, this is a lot of stuff, guys. But again, I went through it. I've fixed it. It's not that stress is ever going to go away. What happens here are the perpetuating factors stay with your brain. And then you have to retrain the brain via the techniques I'm telling you guys right now. Okay, guys, it's a lot of information. But I will tell you, it literally... Uh, it, it literally saved my life in many regards. I wouldn't have been able to function over the past few years if I didn't learn all this stuff and implement it um, because I went through a lot of dark periods uh, in the middle of the night. So it's only through education and implementing that stuff at a high level, being super nerdy about it because I care about myself, just like I care about you guys that you're gonna see success. So there has to be a sense of urgency to change insomnia. It can't be something like, oh, this is annoying, and what, can, let me just take you know, some NyQuil or something like that. You're making a horrible, horrible mistake to take over-the-counter sleep uh, medications, dropping NyQuil or things of that nature. It's a whole different topic. I promise you, I'm not leading you guys astray here. Please listen please implement. And if you have questions, ask below. Have a great day, everyone.